I, I love these two books. I, I bought them when uh, I was a grad student, and the one on the left is from 1971, and the one on the right is from 1976. And I wanted to show you my copies, not the idealized version that you would find on the web, but give you the impression that, that we really do use these books a lot. Um, we, I actually have three sets. We have one in the lab, one in my office, and one at home that when I'm having trouble getting to sleep, uh, I use it there. Um, every time somebody in the lab goes out into the field, these books come out onto the shelf and, and the, the pages get turned and covered with spores off of the specimens. So in these books, uh, 1,611 species are described and illustrated and about 400 and 16 genera. It will become clear why I say about later on, maybe. So there he is in the middle, the man himself, Martin B. Ellis, in between Stan Hughes on the left, and a, a visitor from Australia, Pat Talbot, on the right, and there in, uh, is it Burberry Park? That's not the right name now. I've forgotten the name of the park. 30 miles south of Kew. And Hughes and Ellis used to go collecting together every Saturday morning. Um, but they couldn't look at their specimens until Monday because Mr. Mason was a church-going man and he didn't want people uh, in the lab on Sunday, no matter how enthusiastic they were. So I never met Martin Ellis, unfortunately. He, uh, apparently, according to Paul, he was an early riser and he would get up early in the morning and he would stipple, 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 stipple for a couple of hours. I was puzzled that Every time somebody mentioned him, they referred to him as a prince of a man. And, you know, if you call a woman a princess, it's not exactly a compliment all the time. And I was, I was kind of puzzled. And, but I was assured that they call him a prince of a man because he had a very formal, courtly, uh, discreet manner about him. Now, there was another famous Ellis before M.B. Ellis in mycology, and uh, so a lot of the genera that are Ellis this, Ellis that, are named for the American uh, Ellis. There's only two genera named for Ellis. Uh, one of them is uh, Ellis Ambia, which was named by our, uh, the patron of this meeting, Dr. Simmons, and an anagram of that, Embolicia. Oh, yes. the. Uh, Notice the collecting implement in his lap. This is a, a Nepalese ceremonial dagger called the Kurkuri, and you would not expect a collector of microfungi to be using such a, a thing. So let me give you a quick whirlwind tour of some of these things. So this, is the, this group includes the, the Helicosporus hyphomycetes, and believe me, after a long week of administration and staring at the computer, when you look through the microscope and see that, you have a happy weekend ahead of you. This one, uh, of course, I'm sure you've all heard of this one. This one looks like a bunch of those Dutch licorice, salty, ammonia-tasting candies scattered on the on the bark, so don't let it give you heartburn to look at it, but in, through the microscope it looks like that, just like a, a flat fan. And, and this one, is, this beautiful sporodolkial fungus is enough to turn any staunch teleomorphologist into an anamorphologist. Yeah. <laughs> so this word demetiaceous is a curious word, and I've been trying to track it down. It is demetiaceous, it is not dermatiaceous, it's not derma, like, like skin. Uh, we think that the, the word is derived from the generic name Demetium, but we don't really know what Persone meant when he called this his genus Demetium, and we don't use that genus anymore. But somehow, uh, Ellis chose this term Demetiaceous hyphomycetes, and he doesn't really explain why in any of his books. It's not in the Oxford English Dictionary, but it is in the Dictionary of the Fungi, and the way they describe it is as this pigmented more or less darkly. It would be a good title for a murder mystery, I think. <laughs> so how did these books come about? Um, Dr. Ellis created a whole series of these papers and they were really very detailed taxonomic papers of the type you would expect with a very elaborate uh, stipple dot 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 drawing, a complete description, the usual descriptions of specimens and so on. But when he, he did what very few taxonomists do, he'd, 
he took his life's work and he, and he compressed it down into these two books and tried to make it accessible for people. And one of the ways he did this was to make kind of standardized generic descriptions like this that were very easy to, do, to do, compare with each other. But when he got to the illustration part, he would make a synoptic plate often of all of the species that he uh, accepted in the genus. And if you look at that top line, that description, on, which on the previous slide was 30 lines, is now one line. So he's really used the generic diagnosis as an important element of his uh, taxonomy. So this is the key from the first book. And the, the jargon in this, this work is considerable. Um, you've got wonderful words in there like micronematous, macronematous, semi-micronematous, uh, acrooxic, base oxic. Every time I give this key to a student, I get complaints. And I would, I would say that for myself, it took me years to learn to use this key. But once I learned to use this key, it really does encapsulate a, a, a very specific taxonomic philosophy. Uh, and you, I could use that key, and, and Subramanian could use that key in India, and Brian Sutton could use it in England, and we would all come to the same place for the same fungus. So it, it's actually quite a powerful uh, key once you get used to it. Now, of course, for these fungi in 1976, cultures were not part of the game. And I'm sure you know in 1976, fungi did not have DNA. So uh, this is entirely a morphological system. And I'm going to help matters along by, by providing a few new terms uh, later on in the, in the talk. So there's still an active community of people who do Alician taxonomy of Dometiaceous hyphomyces. There's people in China, there's people in India, uh, Italy, Cuba, Brazil. And they're, they're just building on this foundation. And I would guess that there's probably twice as many species in genera that are described in this way than uh, were in Alice's books. And I would say that, that these people need our help to bring this data into the molecular age. So what Paul and I did for this project was that we, we rebuilt the index to these two books and ran it through uh, Species Fungorum to find out the current name for each of those species. And then I gave that list to my colleague, Wen Chen, and her student, Jenny Liu, to, uh, to, to design queries for GenBank to find out how many of them had ribosomal DNA sequences. 567 of them. There they are. I'm sure you can read them all and see that your uh, favorite fungus has not yet been sequenced. So what are these fungi in modern terms? Um, there are a few Basidiomycetes in the group, most notably Wallemia on the right, but this, we're forbidden to mention Basidiomycetes in an Ascomycete workshop, so don't read the bottom of the slide and ignore the part on the right. Just forget what I just said. The, the cartoon tree there is a, a, a tree of the Dicaria with the Hyphomycete-rich classes marked in green. And I've kind of gone through and marked it with a little bit of a heat map where the demediaceous hyphomycetes tend to go. So there's a, a fair number of them in the sordariomycetes, a bit smaller number in the lodiomycetes. Uh, in the erodiomycetes, we have the ketotheriales, and there's quite a few of them in there. But by far, the major group is the dothidiomycetes. So you've heard a fair amount about most of these groups during the week. In the Dithidiomycetes, there's a lot of in, in, economically important fungi, and, and so this part of the Demediaceous Hyphomycetes has been worked out uh, fairly well. And we've, in order to describe the situation in Dithidiomycetes, we've come up with a new term, and that is uh, to Krauss. And uh, a crow, this, this is a verb. And if you want to know how to use this verb, here's an example sentence. The student was about to publish her thesis research when she discovered she had been Krauss. So it's essential when you're going to publish fungal names in this order <laughs> that you constantly Google and check to make sure that the names you're about to pr uh, propose haven't, uh, haven't put you in this situation where you've already been crossed, even though you thought that, it was, uh, um, that you were in the clear. But note that the word should not be used as an adverb clause. So you shouldn't go about saying, what the cross is going on? 
So Drexler is one of these genera in the Dothidium Iceids that's been relatively absorbed by modern um, phytal taxonomy. And it's, it's worth taking a look at how Ellis treated this group because it reveals that he was simultaneously progressive and conservative in the way he dealt with anamorph taxonomy. So you can see when you look at that at the bottom part, well, to start at the top, he didn't accept Bipolaris as separate from Drexler. He considered them synonyms. And, and Richard Korff at the, uh, I, at the Article 59 debate we had in Oslo's IMC said that Ellis's was a dead hand on the tiller of fungal taxonomy. And he was objecting to this. And you see at the same time that Ellis was using what we would call now a cross-reference naming system. So he said Drexler estate of Pyronophora, Drexler estate of Tretomyxphyria, but um, he, he didn't consider them to be separate anamorph genera. He wasn't worried about correlating anamorph genera and telomorph genera because he believed in form genera. And the form genera were defined by this very specific system that's encapsulated in the key. Now this cross-reference system was used at IMI for decades actually, and it was the under, used in the, uh, as part of the underpinning for uh, index fungorum and species fungorum up until 2012. Right, so in the Sordariomycetes, which is another class with a lot of dermatiaceous hyphomycetes in, there's been a little bit less crossing going on and a little less description of NUSPs. Um, most of the published work has been at the genus level and uh, with a little bit less work on multi-gene phylogenies for this group. And, and you heard quite a bit about uh, some of these things from uh, Wilhelm de Beer yesterday. So here's the list for which no sequences were available. And it's not a perfect list. There's a few problems with it, but uh, I would be delighted to share this with anybody who wanted it. So this is George White, who learned about dimidiaceous hyphomycetes as the technician to Stan Hughes, and, and later he became the mycologist that sort of guarded Canada's uh, borders from threats from all of your countries. So he's retired now, and we go out for collecting a few times every year, and he always asks me what it is I'm interested in, and I always mention four of the big, big messes that are still left in this group, and that's Humicola, Monodictus, Sporodesmium, and Dactylaria. I'm not going to mention Dactylaria any further because after years of collecting and isolating these things, I have nothing sensible to say. I think we need another term, ultra-phyletic, mega-phyletic, something like that. Polyphyletic seems too, too mild. So Humicola is about as simple as it gets. It's a stick with a ball on top, single-celled spore, plastic, usually gray or black. And there actually is kind of a tight clade here. This is in the Ketomi AC, a nice vertical line with the ITS sequences. But among the 70 or so species, there's eight or nine other lineages, and Ketospherialis, Hypocrialis, some of the murky corners of the Dithidium Iceets and Leodium Iceets. So studying simple fungi is good discipline because you have to look at everything possible to have a hope to find an inconspicuous character. You need to turn off what you think you know and learn to see again. And, and what you see is that very vague spot. That's real. And when the spore gets darker, it's still there. It's not a germ tube. It's, it's some thinning in part of the cell wall. And it seems to tell you that it belongs in this particular clade. So monodictus is much the same thing, um, except that the spores become larger and multiseptate. And the, the genus has about 60 species, and if you read the literature, they say it belongs to the Tabufiaceae. I've got it in about seven lineages, none of which are the Tabufiaceae. So it, th this remains a mystery that I haven't been able to figure out. And Sporodesmium complex, you, know, you take the spore and you stretch it out, and you make it as multiseptate as you want. Um, you get species that have tens, maybe even 100, 110 septa in them if you feel like catching, uh, counting them. Uh, Ellis never divided this group up according to his own principles. He just recognized these long spores coming off of, uh, singly off of uh, Canidiogenes cell, and that was sporodesmium. Other people came along later and divided this genus up according to these 
morphological form taxon principles. Um, none of these segregate genera have stood up very well to the limited amount of phylogenetic analysis that's been done. Uh, Marpina did some, uh, Ying did some, uh, Damodar Shinoi did some, but we really don't have much sense uh, to go with this yet, but this is a big genus. There's about 450 species described, and people just keep describing and describing them uh, using these concepts. So when I was doing this talk, I assumed that I would have sequenced a lot more of these unsequenced taxa than I have. The red is, is what I was able to find, so I was quite shocked. Um, the truth is that George collects these fungi a lot faster than I can culture them. So I have another term, a NUSP, new or unsequenced species. I think it's a useful term. I used it earlier to see if anybody was paying attention and nobody seemed to, to scratch their heads. So maybe you all know what that is. Um, it's understandable that we do describe NUSPs. Uh, we can't expect somebody to do a generic revision every time they pick up something that doesn't fit in uh, somewhere. Uh, so we gamble when we describe these species, and, and Dave Hibbick gave a very nice uh, analysis of this situation. You know, if it's true that there's millions of fungal species and we find a rare species, it's more, much more likely that we found a rare species that's undescribed than is described. So it's not a bad gamble, but nevertheless, in the, ter in the context of these books, in the context of, of this material, this is a disturbing pattern. These fungi mostly do culture. Uh, some of them grow very slowly, like a millimeter in a month. Um, often they're sterile. So how do you know you've got the right thing? You find colonies like this, it looks really nice and cool. You just pick up a slurry of spores and spread it out. And what you don't remember is that when wood falls on the ground, this is what happens first. Cladosporium comes out, trichoderma comes out, sometimes penicillium there. They just coat substrate with their spores and you don't even know they're there. Sometimes you find things like this. You've got two fungi growing together, both of which could be expected to form dark, slow-growing, sterile cultures. You don't know um, which one you've isolated unless you're careful. So you have to do a single spore culture. And you can see on this uh, profile is probably three different uh, fungi there. So you have to make sure you pick up the, the single spore, you roll it around in one plate, get rid of any trichoderma, Cladosporium, whatever that might be there, if you're lucky, and put it on another plate, and then replicate it because you you're going to make uh, you're going to have more bad cultures than good. For, so this fungus w gave me some serious lessons. This is I th Marissa Graphium. I tried for years to culture this, and I I decided oh, this is unculturable. And then one day I was throwing out some plates, and I, and that intermediate plate where I had washed the uh, the spore mass, there, there were some cinemata there, and it was the cinemata of this. And so what it is, is that the spore germination rate was really low. It was like somewhere between 1 and 5%. So if you're just picking off three spores, your odds of getting one that's going to germinate are not very good. Oh, and what the sequences tell us about that fungus is that we don't know what it is. It you know, doesn't really fit in any lineages very well. Um, but something else might be going on. I had a long talk with a guy at the uh, IMC last year in, from Brazil who, who's uh, an Elysian style taxonomist and he told me he actually did try to culture everything and he had about a 10% success rate. He, he seemed to be using the same techniques as me. Things were just not growing. And I wonder if uh, some of these uh, spores are either uh, so robust that they they appear intact long after they're dead. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that those thick walls may indicate that something needs to happen there before these spores will germinate, like passing through a mite or um, something like that. So here we are, 35%. That's the percentage of species from Ellis's two books that we have DNA sequence data for almost 40 years after they were published. That's a failing grade for my generation of uh, taxonomists. Who cares? 44%. That's the percentage of genera in our proposed list of protected generic names that we have DNA sequence data for. 
So put these two numbers together and I think we have a disappointing view of how dedicated we are to respecting the taxonomic legacy that has been handed to us. I'm sure many of you have had an epiphany similar to what was expressed here by Proust. You know, to even care about studying microfungi, you have to learn to see the, the world in a different way. And I think we need to remember that we have to look over our shoulders as well. That's part of our, our vision. You know, we, we pass on to our students how important it is, as Joey said yesterday, that we use the latest technology in our research. But we, we need to make sure we give them the skills so that they can look over their shoulders and, and continue to, to take, take up that legacy. So another quote from Eli Wiesel, it's a, it's a paraphrase from this very funny book, The Book of Barely Imagined Beings. If you want, want a good laugh about biology, it's in there. I think uh, my colleagues sometimes feel like an oppressed community, so maybe it's not too trivial to, to quote this, this uh, Nobel Prize winner. So what can help the oppressed, a book? solidarity, and a memory. I've told you about the book. I think that one of the gifts that CBS has given us with this series of meetings and with this meeting, especially with this meeting, is the opportunity to build solidarity. And we should use that to remember these fungi that are on the verge of being forgotten. Thank you.